I think the most important thing is if you're going to blog, be focused in what you're writing about, be consistent in frequency and tone. Business of Architecture, episode 244. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the podcast for architects and designers where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and hyper profitable architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's episode is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one management solution for your architecture firm. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, we speak with architect George Fontan, an architect based in New York City who grew his firm from one part-time intern to five employees in 18 months using a blogging strategy to get new clients. Here in the show, I'm always interested in architects that have had accelerated growth or been able to achieve something that other firms take a lot longer to do. So I'm really happy to jump in today's interview. And without further ado, here's today's show. Hey, George, welcome to the business of architecture. Thanks, Nick. I'm happy to be here. So how did you originally decide to start your firm? Tell me about that process. Well, I always wanted to start my own firm. Um, and uh, after the recession, uh, you know, the, I was working at a big company and they had a lot of people. So I was kind of uh, a little bit forced into it. And uh, I got a few uh, small projects immediately after getting laid off, which, which I was pretty lucky about, uh, to do a restaurant renovation and a, uh, you know, an apartment renovation. And then after that, I was consulting for architects, contractors, and developers, freelancing. Um, and then eventually when things, uh, when the economy got better, um, you know, I went full force with my, with my own firm and started, you know, pursuing projects and, uh, and I got a small office in, in Manhattan. Okay. So you were sort of jumped into it because you were laid off. And was that during the financial crisis, did you say? Yeah. At the, so I was, uh, I was working for a large firm and uh, in 2009, they laid off in like two days, like 100 people. And um, I was one of them. And just coincidentally, two weeks later, somebody calls me up and was like, uh, I know this guy wants to uh, renovate a, uh, a small restaurant in the village. And, um, you know, are you available? I was like, yeah, I'm available. <laughs> You're like, let's do this. <laughs> Am I so, ever? Um, yeah, I was just a, that was just a coincidence right there. And how did that referral come to you? Actually, so I, uh, it was a friend of mine's father was an architect and he knew the guy and he was passing on the job too small for him. Um, cause he had some work at the time. And, uh, so he gave it to, to me and my friend and we just, we just did it together. Um, and then I also was, was, uh, kind of, uh, helping out her, her father, um, with, with some projects in Brooklyn, um, over the next, you know, year or two, uh, here and there. Okay. Fantastic. So the, and that's a strategy I recommend for firms that are starting out. It's a great one. Sounds like uh, you, you got a job from another architect that had a project that was too small and it was perfect for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I and then did you continue to do jobs with this particular architect? How did you kind of stay afloat for those first couple uh, I, months? I did, I did a few things for him. I helped him out with a, with a church he was doing and with an apartment building he was doing um, and, a few, and, a, and a few random things on a freelance basis um, just when he was busy. You know, he's a small firm. I think, you know, it's just like, you know, two people. But, you know, but, you know when he got busy, he would, he would kind of give me a call and like, can you help me out with the job? So, um, and that kind of, you know, having, having, if you, if you have, if, if you're in a recession or if you're starting out and you don't have a lot of clients, if you have a couple people like that, they can help, you know, pay the bills while you're, while you're looking for, for more, you know, independent projects, or even if you have projects, but you just don't have enough. Where were your other sources of projects during that first year? So, um, once the economy started to pick up, I started uh, using AdWords a lot. Um, I was always very much kind of focused on getting clients from online. Um, so, so AdWords is a real, not ideal kind of way to do it. It's expensive and, and you get a lot of kind of bottom of the barrel clients, but at least I was able to pick up some, 
some work, um, you know, here and there, uh, not great projects, but you know, it, it, it was, uh, it, it was bringing some work in and then, um, and then eventually I had to kind of step up my game and I, I, I focused more on, on developing, uh, you know, a more organic presence. Okay. So you started out with AdWords and tell me, how did you learn how to do AdWords? So I, I'm a, a big fan of, uh, you know, learning from YouTube and, uh, you know, and, and just reading people's blogs. Um, you know, uh, there, there are plenty of, of, uh, you know, marketing companies that'll write blog posts, uh, to kind of help you figure things out. You know, they want your business, but, but I'm, uh, you know, when you're starting off, you're, you gotta do as much yourself as you can because you're not gonna have the budget to hire a digital marketing consultant. Most likely, you know, I certainly didn't. Um, so just, you know, a lot of research online, uh, figuring out yourself and trial, trial and error, you know, uh, you, you set it up. If you do something and the phone starts ringing, it means you should do it again. Yeah. Do you still use Google AdWords? Uh, on and off. I, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm much better at it now. It's much more refined, um, setting, setting up your, 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 you know, your keywords and, and, and your ads. Um, I kind of turn it on and off because, uh, I, I have the sense that if I don't use it, then I might be losing some clients. Um, but, uh, but yeah, right now I, I actually have it running, but next week I might not. And what are you finding that works for AdWords? Tell me about the kind of campaigns that you run. Um, so I, I focus, my AdWords campaign is also directly linked to, uh, uh, my organic campaign, right? Cause I have a blog that now is really taken off. And what I do with my AdWords is I focus on keywords that don't seem to work on my blog. And, and I'm using those keywords um, that are really high competitive. For example, New York architects. Um, to rank for that organically, I'm competing with the largest architecture firms in New York. Um, so that's really difficult. But in AdWords, you can do that. So, so it might not work on the blog, on the website organically, but, but you can, you know, you can you can pay for those kinds of clicks, but it becomes it becomes pretty expensive. So that's why I don't think AdWords should be your. I, I, it's certainly not my primary um, client acquisition technique. Yeah, but so it was when I was starting out. So you're doing these in demand keywords, things like New York architecture firm, residential design, New York City, Manhattan, things like things, that. You have yeah, a long list like of, of things, keywords things that are difficult to get. Yeah. Yeah, and those are all through. So you're doing search advertising there. Uh, do you do any sort of remarketing or display advertising, anything like that, or just the search? No, marketing? just the search. And I, you know, and I'm not even 100% convinced that I actually still need to do it. Um, it's kind of one of those things that I've been doing it for years, and and I'm still, you know, I'm a little hesitant to turn it off, but I do turn it off from time to time, and I, probably this time next year I won't be using it at all. When you first started using it, what did you find during those early days that was working for you just in terms of Google AdWords and search advertising? And what didn't work? So, uh, what did it, uh, the more specific you are works better. Um, so like, uh, you're going to throw away a lot of money if you're very, if you, if you start an AdWords campaign and you put architect as your keyword, you're going to lose a lot of money. Uh, that's what I found. Um, so, uh, specific targeting certain specific keywords. Um, if you have like a two or three word phrase is better than a one word. Um, and, and narrowing it down to New York City, you know, not going for New York State or, or close by states like New Jersey, just having it, the, the more specific it is, I think the easier it is to, to have it focused and, and to work for you, but you're spending a, a decent amount of money. You know, the only thing is, you can set up an AdWords account and potentially get a phone call, you know, tomorrow. Yeah, much quicker results than some of the other methods that yeah. we're going to be talking about And also about today. a lot of unqualified phone calls too. Yep. And what was your budget back then that you were spending on AdWords in those early days? Oh, not much. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, $1,000 a month. 
you know. Um, but I would probably run it, um, run out of my budget, and then just you know uh, get it, get a get a get a job, work on it, and turn it back on the following month. You know, after it was off for a couple of weeks, because I because I didn't even have much budget to keep it going. You know, at first. And what kind of ROI were you getting at that time? So let's say you spent a thousand dollars, you brought in a project. In those early days, what would that project bring into the firm? Bring they, into they you, I guess. Pretty, pretty small. Um, what, what I found was I got I got a, I got mostly pretty small jobs, um, like li- little renovation jobs and, and such. But I did get two clients that um, brought me brought me larger work. Um, one of them uh, was to uh, was to help take over a job in the Bronx. That was 10 two family houses that had been going on for eight years and was still not finished. And he basically, a new, a new developer purchased the property. He just found me through my AdWords campaign. And, uh, and, um, you know, he fired everybody, brought in a whole new team, fired the contractor, the architect, the expediter, you know, and then I got another client, um, who was involved in rebuilding after Sandy. So, um, I ended up doing, uh, nine houses. Uh, that were uh, in Breezy Point and Far Rockaway that were rebuilds after Sandy. And they were, they were pretty cool. They were, we did a, a, a couple of, uh, port in place concrete houses and, um, uh, some, uh, steel frame houses and one wood one. And they said they, they didn't want it to blow away again, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So the concrete, the, you know, six inch port in place concrete walls were, uh, hopefully you're going to, going to make it past the next one. <laughs> Was there any other paid advertising that you did during those early days? Um, I, I tried um, a little bit of uh, social, which I never really was able to justify too much to myself that it made sense. Um, it, 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 it makes you think it works because I was getting a lot of followers, but that doesn't necessarily mean the, the phone is ringing. And that's what really kind of matters for, for advertisers. Um, and then I did hire some consultants a couple times to try them out. And I, I think three or four times and I fired them all within, uh, under a month. So, so these uh, would be digital marketing consultants. Yeah. And none of them, they were all terrible. Uh, I never, you know, I was like, you know, it just, it just, I don't know. They, they, they didn't seem they they weren't on message with me you know you have to you have to find somebody that's on your your page um so if they're writing um if they're writing copy for um you know a social media post or something it has to be right you know and so so what really i found that um it was better that we just do it ourselves um now i you know there's five of us in the office um whereas uh before uh, you know years ago it was just me and a laptop so um now, now, you know, we, we do everything 100% ourselves. We don't use any consultants beyond hiring somebody technically to work on, you know, maybe coding for the website for customization, and things like that. What year did you, uh, were you let go of the firm? 2009. 2009. And then when do you feel that you really kicked off this new firm? I mean, when did you transfer from kind of freelancer to like, okay, this is a firm? What year was 2014. that? 2014. I'll, I'll, I'll say the, the day that I got an actual office when I started renting uh, a brick and mortar uh, space in Manhattan uh, in 2014. Okay, awesome. So, and now I have a bigger office. That first office was uh, 240 square feet. Nice. And I shared it, I shared it with somebody else. Um, and now we have about 750 square feet and that is a huge improvement. What other things, were there any other things you tried that didn't work during that first year? That didn't to- work? Uh, yeah, networking events. I went to a lot of networking events. I never got a, a, a single project. Um, I went to, um, the, the grad school that I went to had, a, had, um, you know, a monthly networking event I was going to constantly and I'd hand out a lot of business call cards, but nobody, nobody would call. I'm not really, you know, I, I don't think, I think certain people are good at that too. Whereas I'm more, I want people to find me. I don't want to go chasing people down. Um, also, I don't think chasing people is too sustainable when you're busy. 
when you're not busy, you have all the time in the world for it. But um, people have to, you need a system for people to find you as opposed to running around chasing thoughts. So the networking wasn't very effective. What kind of groups did you go? Did you do any other networking besides the grad I, school I, group? You know, no, I'm, I mostly stick with school groups. I, w I would go to occasionally, you know, this, I'm in New York City, so there would be like big events. Um, I would go to those too with a, you know, pocket full of business cards. And, and, you know, it just, I didn't see any, I, I certainly never got any work from it. And maybe once or twice somebody would call, but, you know, it, it never, it never went anywhere. I mean, every, a lot of people will talk to you like, oh, I've got this project. You know, I'm going to do this or this or that. But, uh, you know, talking about it and, and, you know, writing checks are two different things, you know, and like I said, I just, it just seemed like, uh, putting, putting a lot of time on, on something where, you know, if you have, if you're chasing people, you can only chase so much, but if people are coming towards you, you can have a lot of people calling your office and a, and a team of people answering the phone if you need to, you know? Awesome. So when you went to these networking events, were these the kind of events where you would potentially find potential clients? Like the, there would be a lot of, you know, they're the kind of events where the ideal clients were hanging out. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think that that's what people that you might think you're going to find there. But when you actually get there, I found that networking events were all people looking for work. Yeah. You know, um, uh, you know, you're not going to meet Larry Silverstein at, uh, at a networking event. You know, he, he built the World Trade Center. He doesn't need to go to a networking event. That's right. And I saw your face light up when you talked about the difference between chasing clients and then actually having clients come to you. And we're going to jump into that. So you you went away, you implemented, you started blogging, but let's let's talk about that now, which is kind of the centerpiece of what we're going to talk about. How did you transition? Okay, so... Um, I mentioned doing a lot of research when I was doing AdWords. And then, so I was, I found this company, Moz, that's based out of Seattle. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them, but they have a fantastic blog and they have, they're, they're, they're basically an internet marketing company. Um, and, and I've always been someone that thinks architects need to not only learn from architects. We need to learn from other people. So, um, if you're trying to find a marketing campaign idea, I wouldn't necessarily just look at what a successful architect is doing, but look at startups, look at, you know, look at them and see, see what they're doing. So, so I, I just, I, I came across a blog by this firm, Oz. Um, they, they have analytics for your website, you know, so I, I, you know, I, I, I took a free trial. I ended up, you know, uh, becoming a member and getting, getting the analytics on my website. And, and I started reading their blog posts and, and watching. They have these great videos on Whiteboard Friday. Every Friday, they post a video on a very specific topic related to either technical backend issues for your website or just, you know, concepts for internet marketing. And I realized the way they were getting clients were from people watching their blog and reading their blog, you know, and that's why they had the blog. And then I thought to myself, I should do exactly what they're doing. You know, this company, it was started by one guy and his mom. And then, then they became, you know, they're doing, you know, how many millions of dollars worth of, uh, you know, sales every year, you know, and with, I think two, you know, in 10 years, they went to like 200 employees or something. Um, I might be wrong on the number, but you know, so, uh, so I just started taking, I, I took their lead and this was in 2016. I started, uh, I just decided I was going to start blogging, you know, completely based on what I saw from them. Yeah. Do you remember how many employees, what was the size of the office back in 2016? My office was me and one part-time intern who was still okay. in school. So you had one part-time intern. And before that time, you were probably getting your jobs from referrals and then the AdWords campaign that you were doing. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So 2016, you saw what Moz was doing. You said, hey, little light bulb went off. You said, hey, look, if it worked for then, I'm going to kind of try the same strategy. What did you start mm -hmm. to implement? So the first thing I did was I downloaded a WordPress theme that had a, 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 a an easy to use blog platform, and um, you know I I you know redesigned the, the website you know uh, pretty pretty making it pretty simple, easy to navigate, um, and and I just started blogging, and I was really bad at it. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I just started, you know, I just started writing some, some random, random posts about topics that I thought people would read. Nobody was reading them. Um, do you what remember happened? what some of those first topics were? Uh, so I, my, you know, they, the one problem that I've always had with blogging is I never know when I write a blog who's going if somebody's actually going to read it or not. Um, even still now, I write some posts, nobody reads it, and then I write other posts, and they do. So I was writing things that I thought people would read, like um, a lot of renovation stuff, because that's what I was doing mostly at the time. Uh, so I think my first blog post was like um, just talking about that you need to do asbestos testing, because I I found you know. I also try to think of what my clients, the problem with my clients, you know, I always have to explain that to a client. Yeah, you're doing a small apartment renovation in New York, but you still need to get an asbestos test. You know, th- then I was writing about like alteration agreements for buildings when you're going to renovate a co-op or a condo, you know, those kinds of things. And I think they were good topics. Um, I think maybe I was just not very, you know, I got better at the writing. I got better at organizing my blogs. Um, after a while. So, so it might not necessarily have been the topic failed that just, I wasn't, uh, experienced yet at blogging, you know, after you've done, you know, almost a hundred blog posts, you get better at it. And how many blog posts did you start out doing when you started blogging? So I, I was doing it very sporadically. Um, maybe at most three a month when I first started in 2016. Um, and, uh, I wasn't really getting much traction and I probably would not have continued except that I wrote one blog post where after about a week of writing it, somebody called me up who was, uh, interested. He never ended up hiring me, but nonetheless, he called me up and he was interested in, in the topic and, uh, was, was considering doing a small building in Brooklyn. Um, and because of that, it kind of kept me encouraged and seeing the success of that one blog post, um, helped me redirect what I was writing about. That one, that one was a uh, very, spe- it was like, it was ultra specific on R6 zoning in New York City, um, which is, it's the only residential zoning that's in actually every borough of New York City. Um, and I just kind of did, a, I did a zoning analysis as as a blog post you know and um actually that that blog post has uh since brought me the most um that was my first blog post that anybody actually read and that that one has brought me the most amount of work um of any of my blog posts awesome do you know what the title of that post is i think it was r6 zoning residential development r6 zoning nyc residential developments maybe yep great so that reinvigorated you actually got a phone call and how did you know that that call came from that article Oh, the guy told me, he's like, I just read your blog post um, on R6 zoning and I'm looking to buy a property and I want to talk to somebody uh, about, you know, about it before, um, before I purchase it, um, which has been something that I get a lot of. Um, so I was trying to, you know, the, the goal there for converting to a client was to see if he would hire us to do a uh, zoning analysis on the property before he purchased it and a feasibility study. You know, which we do all the time. And, and my blog brings in a lot of those kinds, kinds of clients. Um, it just, it never went anywhere. So I don't know if the guy even ever ended up purchasing the property. But the fact that he called, it was the first call where somebody said, I read your blog. So it, you know, I, I really think had that not happened at some point, I would have said, this isn't working. Cause I, by then I had been blogging for, for almost a year. Um, so, and I was doing maybe two or three posts a month. So I might have had, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 blog posts by that time, you know? Um, so that takes us up to about 2017. Is that right? Yeah. To the beginning of 2017. And then at that point, did you, did you change the frequency? And if so, how often did you start writing? Yeah. So, so I think in January of 2017, um, another client called me who is a pretty sub- decent sized property owner. And he had read a blog post also on zoning um, and uh, really uh, complimented me a lot on my blog post, which made me feel really good. Um, But he also hired me to do two zoning analyses on properties that he wanted to purchase. Um, And that, that was the first client that actually gave me a check who found me on my blog. Um, And at this point I had one intern 
in the office. Um, and uh, later on, so he just hired me to look at two properties that he wanted to build. But later on, he actually hired me to do several more things over throughout, you know, during 2017. Awesome. And so tell me about the blogging strategy. How did it progress then into 2017? So in 2017, I was focused incredibly on that exact type of client, the person who's looking to purchase a property who's in the research phase. Cause that's the whole point about blogging. You, you're not, you're not, you're not finding an architect on a blog by typing in, I want to hire an architect today. You know what I mean? You're finding an architect, an architect's blog by researching a topic. So whether it's building a house, or, you know, uh, you're going to buy a property in New York City and, you know, New York City has complicated zoning and you just want to research what are the rules and what's allowed in an R6 zoning district, right? So I really focused on that. I wrote a lot of blog posts about, about zoning and development and feasibility, the kind of the stuff you do early on. And what ended up happening is in 2017, I, I can't tell you exactly, but I, I would say we probably did, um, you know, one, one or two, um, once or twice a month, we would do a zoning analysis for somebody, uh, looking to purchase a property for the whole year. So I, I, I could say we easily did well over 20 last year, uh, maybe, maybe probably 30, uh, zoning analysis. Um, and, and a couple of those people converted into, uh, into bigger projects. How long are the blog posts that you write? What do you find that works best in terms of length? All right. So length, um, you know, it reminds me of architecture school. Uh, uh, what my history, uh, professor, somebody asked him, you know, how long should the paper be? And he said, it should be long enough to make your point. Um, so I think that that's, it depends on the topic. You know, I have some blog posts that are really long. Um, one of my most read blog posts is 21 ideas for a sustainable house design, right? Um, that's a long blog post because it's, you know, I'm hitting so many different things, but you know, um, I wrote, you know, you, if you write another blog post about a very specific topic, two paragraphs might, might cover it. So I don't really follow any rules as far as, um, length, but I do try to really cover the topic without having any filler, you know, don't make it longer just for the sake of it, but, but really explain the topic. Like somebody should, somebody should walk away. Uh, with it, with you know, with a good understanding of the general issues. And what's your process for, as we call, optimizing a blog post for particular keywords? Okay, so I use I mentioned the the software Moz. Um, I use I, I believe a lot in analytics. Um, I use Google Webmaster Tools. I use um, Google Analytics, and so you want to look at previous blog posts, and you want to see how they perform if you know, and, and before you write more blog posts and that'll really help steer you in the right direction. So also I'm very big fan of going back to old blog posts that you wrote a year ago and sprucing them up because you're probably a little better at it. You know, now in 2018, I'm better than at it than I was in 2016, but, um, I don't, I don't do it, go too crazy with keyword research. Um, mostly I'm trying to fill out the topic, you know, um, the topic has, there's a primary topic for every blog post, but then there, there's some subtopics as well. There's the points you want to hit and you want to cover the topic entirely. Um, and not, you know, and I don't, yeah, I don't go too crazy on the keywords, but, but keywords are important. You want to think about expressions that people commonly use, you know, and not go into too much, um, unusual jargon, you know, uh, unless it's, unless it's necessary. What's your posting frequency right now for the blog? Uh, in 2018, I think we're doing a little over one a week. Some weeks we'll do two, um, but we got a one a week minimum. Um, and I think we're going to hold that steady. I'm, I'm going to try to do, uh, you know, if I could hit, if I could do a hundred this year, I think that would be awesome. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll definitely be, be, uh, be more than one per week. Who writes the articles? We do Fridays. Um, uh, I got people working on uh, graphics right now for for two different blog posts. Um, we work on projects all week long, and as best we can, Friday is the day 
I, I think having a schedule actually for me really helps. Um, uh, Friday's the day that we tr do everything that's not project related, um, which is not to say the entire office is working on the blog, but, um, you know, I think only one person right now is working on projects today. And, um, and we're, you know, uh, I'm also not just working on the blog all day, but Friday's a good day to do proposals, to do those, those other things. And, you know, have a little more of a, of a, of a low stress day. Uh, you know, working on the blog can be a little fun too, you know? So, so I kind of like to end, end the week on that. So who are the writers on the team? How much the, do you well, write versus writer, team? Me. Yep. Um, and one junior architect, Robert, who's, uh, who's, who's really great. Um, he does, he does quite a bit of writing. Um, so mostly he and I, but I, I've, I've written the majority of the, of the blog. And have you ever tried outsourcing writing? I've thought about it and I talked to, I, I would say I talked to a dozen people, freelancers. Um, I think for me, having the right voice is really important and also not having to hold somebody's hand. I've always felt if I have to hold your hand through doing something, I might as well just do it myself. Um, and, and I've kind of, I don't, I don't want to say too much that I like blogging because I think that's a, that's an exaggeration, but I kind of like it <laughs> a little bit. So it's nice on Friday to have a little relaxed day at the end of the week and, and, and put it, put together some content. Um, definitely the staff does all the graphics. If we have diagrams or, you know, photoshopping some old stuff, you know, for the blog. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of like to get into it a little bit. And when did you hire your second employee? Tell me when that happened, when you started to grow so, the team. So in 2017, in the summer, we started to get projects. Um, in the spring or summer, we started. And um, so I hired another. Uh, so I had, I guess, by then I had one full-time person. Then we hired another intern. Um, and then just... You know, and we were in a 250 square foot office that I was sharing with somebody else. And I think at one point we just found ourselves with like, you know, four or five people working there. I was using some freelancers at the time, um, to pick up as we got busy. Um, so by the end of the year, we just started looking for a, looking for a bigger office. And now, you know, there's five of us. We have a 750 square foot office and it's a lot more comfortable. How did you know that it was time to bring someone on board? It's a question I get a lot, which is how do I make that first hire? When you can't finish your work. If you can't finish your, if you can finish your work, you don't need somebody else. If you can't finish your work, you do. It's that simple. Um, if you're falling behind, you need help or you need to restructure your management. Uh, sometimes, um, you're behind schedule because you're not managing your work very well or you have some unruly clients that don't let you finish your work. Um, by, you know, changing things every single week for, for six months. But, um, but I, it was really just an issue of, you know, if I can't get this, if, if I'm going to fall behind schedule on the job, you know, I need to hire another person. That's, that's really the only, the only driving factor for me. Have you ever had to let someone go who wasn't a fit? I'm very good at firing people. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me, I, tell me I, your I, process. I fired, somebody, okay. I fired somebody after two days once. How'd you I, know that person wasn't a fit? Um, the problem with that person was they had inc a lot of experience, but it didn't show at all. And, and I found, I saw, you know, junior architects that just knew more. And, and I don't know what, what that person was doing before for the past 10 years. But, you know, if you have 10 years experience, you, you need to be able to handle a certain amount of responsibility and, and, and not be asking me simple questions. So, um, I don't have a lot of, you know, I got to run a business. I got to work on, you know, projects. You know, I mean, I'm not really doing much drawing these days, but still, um, I have a lot of, uh, of things to do and, and I can't, uh, uh, you can't hold somebody's hand who has 10 years experience. And that was the most experienced person I ever hired. Since then, I've been, I really prefer to hire, uh, younger people who, uh, less experienced people, I should say, um, and kind of train them up rather than hiring somebody with experience. Because the they might not be on the same page as me either. Yeah, and how do you 
ensure, do your best to make sure you're getting the right person? What what process do you go through or how do you identify? So I, <laughs> I've, I, I've hired people from, from a five minute phone call. I think resumes, um, you know, are really great. Uh, they just tell you where a person worked and where a person went to school. And that doesn't tell you who they are and what they are. Um, I'd much rather just hire a person. And if they, you know, I, t- I, I, I tell everybody that I interview, um, that it's kind of, uh, I try to, or I try to, to tell them, that, you know, I'm going to hire you on a trial basis, you know, and, um, see how it works out. Cause uh, I'm, uh, you know, when you're a small firm, every single person really matters and you have to have the right person. And, um, so I think it's just try, try them out. And if it doesn't work, you got to tell them they can't stick around, you know, okay. and, uh, you know, I, there's not much you're going to learn from a, from, for me, at least, I don't feel like I learn, I get much from an interview and a resume, you know? Um, but, 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 you know, after a week of having somebody in the office, you, you know, them, you know, pretty good. Let's go back to the blogging. So what is the typical process when uh, a client finds you on the blog? Tell me about that process. How does that happen? Well, usually, so I think a lot of clients, um, find the blog because they're researching a very specific topic and then they either call us or, or send us an email or they don't. And then sometimes they might be researching a topic. And this is the best, the kind of the best thing that happens is, and they'll, they'll be reading about something else and they'll come across our blog again on a different topic, you know? So they might, you know, and, and, um, I've had people call, call me on that and, and, you know, um, say, you know, I've, I've read several of your blog posts. You know, I, I came across it while I was doing research the past you know, two months and I just have to give you a call and tell you about what I'm planning to do and see if you're interested in helping us out, you know, but some people, um, uh, let me tell you about one specific project. Um, I had a guy who, uh, read my blog, posted a, posted a question on it. I, I, I let people to post comments and, and questions. Um, he posted a question and within three weeks I had a signed contract and a check and we were building him a uh, four-story townhouse in Brooklyn. You know, um, not everybody moves that fast on the blog because, like I said, I think it's a lot of research and more. It's a little more front-loaded in that way. But um, but there are some people that they, they they look at it and they know you know I want to work with you, and, uh, and 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 they go forward. But but I think a lot mostly people they call me and they're kind of trying to figure things out and we help them through that process. And then eventually they can convert to a client. Are you building an email list in addition to the blog? No, not really. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't put really much effort into, I need to, uh, go for work so much as people need to come get us. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there would be some benefits for it, but it's not something, uh, I've worked at, um, the only thing I do, I have a big whiteboard on my wall over here and, um, I have a list of all the, the potentials that, um, I want to follow, keep following up with. And, um, you know, that's, that's really it. So it's, it's, it's not a list. It's just certain people that I, that I want to keep in touch with. And what's your process for following up with someone? How do you do that? Well, the first thing is every time, uh, a client calls, we have a form in the office that we fill out. Um, either if somebody answers the phone or if I, if I'm talking to them, um, we put them up on the board and, um, you know, we, we try to follow their pace. Some clients move fast. Um, I, I had a client email me. I, I had a client email me yesterday, uh, after hours as I checked my email and I think I replied to the email at like eight o'clock at night. And, uh, this morning we have a verbal agreement to renovate his apartment. Um, I'm set to meet him on Monday morning and we're going to sign the contract and get a check at 10 a.m. on Monday. You know, very few clients move at that pace, you know, at least in my experience. Um, and when they do, they're usually the smaller jobs. But, um, but like I said, you know, we, we try to, we try to figure out each client who, how they are, you know, how, how quickly they're moving and, and, um, you know, but, but you gotta, you gotta follow up with people, you know, and some clients just gotta forget about. It. And how do you respond when people ask you what your fees are? 
what my fees are. Um, I, it, that's probably the worst question somebody can ask in, in certain ways. Um, cause it's the toughest one to answer. Uh, I, first of all, I want to start off. I, I really believe in the idea of pricing the client, not pricing the project. Um, in the sense that I, you know, I'm, so I mentioned I'm doing a townhouse for this guy, right? He found me on my blog. Um, he's a pretty easy client to work with, but I bet I could do a townhouse down the street and spend twice as many hours for a different client. Um, so that's, that's one big challenge that you don't, if you haven't worked with a client before, you don't know how difficult this job is going to be. But when people ask me about my fees, I try to, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of pointing them in the right direction without putting anything too concrete, um, too quickly. So I might give them, uh, I ask them about their budget and I try to talk about the cost. I always try to talk about the cost of the whole project, um, just because it makes your fees sound not so big. Um, so, so I, I start off by saying, we got to figure out a project budget. Um, and then I tell them my fees will be a small portion of that. And I depend, you know, I might tell them it's a percent, you know, a percentage one day, the next day I might tell them a, a cost per square foot. And another day I might say, oh, it might be between this and this, depending, you know, and I'm also, um, I really don't know what other architects do, but I try, I, I usually, um, you know, we do tiny jobs and we do larger jobs too. Uh, I usually include the MEP structural, uh, everybody in my price. Um, and, and I find that to be a huge problem because a lot of people don't. So, um, I'll get a client who, you know, like, uh, you gave me a, you gave me this price and this other guy came in at 30% of your cost. And it's like, well, I'm not really that much more expensive than him. He's not including CA and, and, and all of these other, you know, all of these other things. Awesome. So for instance, the client that you mentioned who just recently called you and uh, sent an email and the next day you had a verbal agreement, was there a discussion about fees on that or were they pretty confident they wanted to use you and they just said, hey, I'll figure that out later? I gave him a price. The job, it, that was a small job. That's an apartment renovation job. So I don't think on a bigger job, somebody would have uh, agreed in less than 24 hours. Um, so he had sent me uh, an e a pretty descriptive email of the work to be done. Um, this was uh, this was actually a referral job. This one didn't come in from the con from the client. Um, I had worked with his contractor before, um, and uh, you know, I just I just shot out a number over the phone, um, and he said, uh, "Is that the best price you can give me?" And I said, "Yes, it is." And he said, "You know, we had maybe a fifteen minute conversation." And he said, "Look, uh, I'm ready to go. If you want to um, if you want to send me a proposal, let's let's make an appointment and get started." Awesome. How many? But if it's a bigger job, I try to uh, not get too specific too fast because um, sometimes you can make a mistake, you know, and under underbid the job or overbid it. So you want to get you want to get the right price, you know. Um, so I think if I think if there's nothing wrong with giving a client a range or tell or, or telling them it's going to be, you know, maybe this price per square foot or something like that, you know, something something more general. What percentage of your current client flow do you think comes from your blogging activities? Uh, right now, most of it. Um, it not every client, you know, I, 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 I don't kind of hound my clients about where did you find me too much. Um, usually when somebody finds me from my blog, they tell me, you know, they, I, I literally the first thing they say is, I'm like, hello, this is George. And they're like, hey, George, I was just reading your blog and, you know, here's my story. You know, um, that, that's how the conversations start. Um, this guy, you know, he happened to come from a contractor that I had worked with, um, which by the way, uh, you really have to have a good relationship with contractors. Um, if you don't try to, you know, keep, they, they have a lot of, uh, referral power, especially if you're doing, you know, home renovations or single family houses or those kind of, that kind of residential work, or even if it's small or, you know, retail or commercial jobs, they, they have a huge amount of referral power um, that you, that you want. So so you should uh, you should learn to work well with, with contractors. But but right now I would say um, I don't I, I don't know the exact number, but I would say definitely the majority of our clients are finding us on our blog, especially the larger projects. Are, uh, the larger projects are one hundred percent coming from the blog. Awesome. And the the new construction 
or uh, major, you know, major renovations or building additions. We have several, you know, um, I mentioned that, you know, that guy, we're doing a, a new townhouse for him in Brooklyn. We're doing a, uh, an eight unit uh, building in Brooklyn as well. Um, that client uh, found us on our blog during, during research and that client's looking to do some more properties. So we're, we're hoping to get those as well. Um, we're trying to do a good job with them on the first one. So, Are there any other insights you feel we didn't touch on about the blogging strategy, George, that you'd like to share with us? Um, I think, I think the most important thing is if you're going to blog, um, be focused in what you're writing about, be consistent in, in frequency and tone. Um, you know, and, and have, you know, if you're, you know, uh, if you're focusing on certain types of topics and they're working, stick with it and don't, you know, maybe don't fluctuate too much. What has no, been your? Is, do, do what works. I'm sorry. Do do what works. I'm a big fan of when something works. Keep doing that. And speaking of what works, what have you found to be the biggest kind of business insider lesson that you've learned over these past, you know, five years since you've been doing this, or even longer on your own? Um, there's a huge benefit of being a resource, and that's what blogging has been for me. So um, when somebody considers you part of their research, you know, spectrum of, you know, uh, that puts you in a really great position. And because um, that's because that's where you are. Clients are hiring you because you're a resource of, of your professional. You you can you can accomplish something for them. So so that's kind of uh, that's that's the positioning of this you position yourself as as a you position yourself in the way clients are going to see you and that should be planned and it shouldn't be coincidental great is there is there a question that you you think i should have asked you that i didn't i don't know i guess uh if you know one other important factor is Aside from, you know, having a blog and people, you know, researching you, re researching and finding you is once they call you, you still got to get the job, you know, um, and you have to, you, you have to learn how to, first of all, figure out which clients are not worth pursuing because they're not going to all be worth pursuing. Um, and that's, that's really hard. Um, but, but, but converting the client, cause they can call you, but, but th that doesn't mean they're ready to sign, sign a contract. Um, so you gotta keep up, you know, a keep up their expectations and B don't, uh, don't run around chasing work that you're, that you can't, you know, that you're putting too many hours into it, um, also becomes an issue. You know, you got to get a client to, you know, I try to focus on, you know, I mentioned zoning analysis. If a client calls me and says, I want to do a, uh, a, a, a small building in Brooklyn or, 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 or in Queens, you know, the first thing I try to do is don't, I don't want, I don't want to sign a contract to design a building today. Let's just sign a contract to do the preliminary zoning analysis. And that, that will also, so A, it'll help you figure out what the scope of work is and B, it helps you figure out the client. And, um, you know, and really, you know, gives you that time to, to, to work out a, a full proposal for, a new, for, 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 for the bigger project. You know? Awesome. Well, thanks, George Fontan, for joining us on the business of architecture. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. And that's a wrap. If you'd like to discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar on that page you'll be able to sign up for a free 90 minute online training on how to do what dan talked about in today's interview how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk today's podcast is sponsored by bqe core office management software for architects get rid of the post-it notes and excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all the profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. 
Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.